Paul, I have some sad news this week. Oh no, what happened? Uh, you might remember Michael Goodfellow. He wrote the Sea of Memes website, and he was kind yeah, of... Yeah, he did some programming <laughs> projects, and he's making like a, some sort of MMO or something. Right, sent me a bunch of 3D printed uh, stuff that he'd done. I considered him a friend of the site. I got an email this week, apparently from his sister, letting me know that he has passed on. Oh, wow. Yeah, he'd been sick for a little while, and he just, he passed. And so that's real sad. But yeah. I'm telling, yeah, I'm telling people on the site because it, it always worries me or makes me feel anxious when people vanish. And, you, you know, we have people from my site that just vanish, and you always wonder, what happened to them? Did they move on? Are they just like, did they change their handle or their persona? And we don't know. So in this case, if you're looking for closure, Michael Goodfellow has passed on. I will link to his website in the show notes for the curious. Is his website going to continue to be up uh, in the future, foreseeably? Good, good question. I'm not sure. I, I have, in fact, I would doubt it. I don't think his family was super tuned in to like what he was doing, like his projects. I don't want to reveal any personal information, but I don't think I don't think there's going to be anybody that'll be like, I was I'm in charge of taking care of the website and keeping it up. Which if I die, I have definitely made it clear to my family. I don't care what you do with my body, but make sure my website stays up. Like, <laughs> throw me in a garbage bag and dump me in the river. I don't care, but make sure my, my website stays up for a few years, as long as possible. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, yeah, it would be interesting to go through and kind of see where he, uh, where he left off. All right. This is really sad and kind of stressful, so let's talk about something more lighthearted. Uh, what's going on with the coronavirus, Paul? Ah, coronavirus. I don't know. It's, you, you know how you have like blizzards and stuff, right? Right, very occasionally. And, and like the day before the blizzard or whatever, like everyone buys all the water and toilet paper and things. Right, buy water. Guys, it comes out of the walls of your house. And if that, even if that's not working, by definition, after the blizzard, your yard will be full of it. <laughs> Covered Don't in water. Buy water. <laughs> Bring some inside and you will have water. But yeah, people exactly. just hoarding things just ridiculously. I mean, certainly get a couple extra things so you don't, you know, instead of shopping for a week, shop for, you know, three weeks. That's a totally reasonable thing to do. But yeah, people just like buying up the entire supply of some good is just silly behavior and just causes more problems. So we don't get blizzards. And uh, right. so seeing the, the store like just cleaned out of staples and things is just kind of weird it's not like for me it's not shocking it's just like oh well yeah this is what happens when people kind of panic um and i've lived other places so i've seen this kind of thing but it's weird here because like it, it just never happens here i am encouraged that people are panicking this is one of those weird can one of those weird situations where the more people panic probably the better off everybody is. I want everybody to be as paranoid as possible because that's going to change their behavior. Yeah, reduce the likelihood that it's going to actually kill a bunch of people. When people panic over a blizzard and freak out, it's usually super annoying because it's like, we've, we've had these before. We know how these go. It's not that big a deal. It'll be fun. Right. And no matter what you do, there's still going to be a blizzard. Like, it's not going to change right. things. Right, you can't stop the blizzard. Uh, but yeah, if you panic about disease and you get super paranoid and you don't want to leave your house, that's good. I mean, assuming you don't live in an apartment yeah. building. You can block, you can stop the, the disease. Yeah, I think the timing here is fortunate. School's letting out, like, right about now. Um, actually, normally, uh, I guess there's another month of school left. But, you know, this is a good time for this to to hit the United States when school's about to let out and then all the kids won't be going to their petri dishes every day yeah that we call public schools on Thursday our kids all go to public school and on Thursday that 
uh, the school sent out a thing saying, we're canceling the public events, but we're still going to be open because it seems like everything's fine. And then apparently they got like a hundred zillion phone calls and Friday they're like, okay, we're, we're closing the school for the next three weeks. We heard you. Calm down. Huh. I mean, I'm not sure why people would be angry. I, I guess, okay, like I would just not, if I was really that worried, I just wouldn't send my kid to school. But I guess if your kid takes the last month of school off, there's maybe a concern that they'd fail and have to repeat that entire grade. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. Well, and in I, California, they have to call the uh, whatever child protective services on you if your kid is out of school for more than 10 days. And oh. it's, a, it's a big pain. Yeah, although they can't call CPS on all of us if we stay. Yeah, but I see why people were angry. Right, where it's like, look, I want to, you know, I want to do the right thing for my kids, and it seems like that is taking them out of school. So why don't you just make it official, and then it won't be a problem. Right. So not a problem here. I think there are only two confirmed cases in my entire state. So the panic is much less where I am than where you are. Hmm. Yeah, we have only two in our county. But we're right next to L.A. County, and it's gonna get bad yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it has to... L.A. is just so packed. Yeah, and there's a large homeless population, too, that's gonna... It's gonna get in there and get crazy. You probably don't have that problem up in Butler where it gets cold. Right. Uh, um, so, what's the population of, like, L.A.? Uh, the greater L.A. area? L.A. County, I, I think, is... 20 million? I'd have to look it up. The population of Pennsylvania, the entire population of this giant state, which is uh, one of the larger states by by area, um, is 12 million. Okay, I just looked it up. L.A. County proper is 10 million, but then there's Anaheim and Long Beach and the Valley and stuff, and it's, yeah, it's right around 2022 if you count, you know, that whole area, the whole metropolitan connected zone. Wow. And we have 12 million spread across the entire state. We have like 284 people per square mile, which is pretty dang spread out. When you get outside of Pittsburgh and Philly, we basically, the place is basically uninhabited. It's just, it's just woods and deer. So what you're saying is that if we need toilet paper, we should just come visit Butler. You'd think so, but, um... I think we're having, I think we're, people are panicking even here and buying tons of stuff, even though, you know, there's just no reason to go crazy here yet. But then again, yeah. I suppose it's good. So I'm curious, how much is this going to disrupt your life? Like, is this interfering with work or travel or plans or? Uh, the company I work for has overseas, they actually have a branch in China. And the China guys are actually all back to work now. They're all like, well, it's blown over. Everything's fine. And uh, so we're uh, sanguine that everything's going to be okay. Um, I'm still commuting to work. It's it's right here in town, and it's not like a whole bunch of people stop by the office. So we're not a real right. big target for infection. Um, so we're not planning on shutting down, but mm, who knows? I can do my work from home. Uh, I do quotes and and. Most of the stuff I do, I can do remotely. So I've got a, a VPN and I've got a laptop. And if I need to stay home and work from home, I can. Um, Anna is a stay-at-home mom. And so the kids being out of school doesn't really disrupt anything. We don't have to, like, get a sitter or anything. She doesn't have to go to work. Um, so it doesn't really change anything for us. We're we're actually kind of, kind of happy to have the kids home. Yeah. Well, this has no impact on me or my work. <laughs> You're, you weren't going to go out anyway. Exactly, exactly. The The chances of me leaving the house were astronomical. So now they are slightly more astronomical. Uh, astronomically small. Or the chances of me going out are astronomical. You know what I mean. I'm not going outside. Minuscule. Right. Um, now, but Heather has some... Does she still do nannying? She does. And so she has the three girls she takes care of. And they have been going to school, and that's a mild concern for us. Again, Pennsylvania hasn't really been touched by this yet. And I think I think the cases we do have are on the other, you know, 600 miles away. So right. we're not worried yet, but, you know, it's a little bit worrying, you know, with public school. But I think they're cutting down on school activities or short... They're, they're doing something here with regards to school. 
um, maybe they canceled a bunch of, oh, they canceled, like, after school activities, like, sports games and whatever, because just, there's no reason to have all those people congregate for optional right. things. So, yeah, we're, it's, uh, I think if it got worrisome, she would just take the summer off, so no big deal. And they, they don't right. really need her very much in the summer anyway, so again, no problem. Oh, she tutors a guy who's uh, a senior in college, and but he's off. He's off for the year. You know, he's, uh -huh. he's his universities are all shut up. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, that would be a worry if he was going to a university every day. But nope, nope. So I think we're fine here. Very good. I'm curious. I'd love to hear in the comments if anybody's living in a area that concerns them, and how much is this affecting your life. If you have any stories to tell, I would love to hear them in the comments below. All right. Well, that was a little scary, and the story behind before that one was sad. Now let's talk about Crunch at Naughty Dog. Jason, Sh this is just the week of bad news. Jason Schreier has posted yet another one of his exposés, and this one is focused on uh, Developer Naughty Dog, and I've praised them before because I think they make really great games. Even I don't really enjoy playing them, but they're one of the few studios that I think is really strong narratively. And they apparently have been for years crunching to an insane degree. As other companies, even EA has backed off from the really, really heavy-duty crunch. And Naughty Dog is still at it. And it's so bad that over the last few years, at their at their flagship studio, they lost 70% of their top, like, creative people. Like, kind of their leadership. What? Like, like, 70 like turnover or just, like, laid off? Yeah, tur turnover. People quit because it was just too much crunch. Just literally six days a week, 16-hour days kind of insanity. Wow. And, okay, I want to read a particular paragraph that really caught my eye here. Crunch culture at Naughty Dog isn't a secret. The studio is open about this mentality in interviews with new hires, and its managers deliberately seek out perfectionists in art, design, engineering, and all the other disciplines that make games happen. The type of people Naughty Dog wants to hire are the type of people who will willingly stay late at the office in order to make their games better. The type of people who would take the time to make sacks of... Okay, this is referring to a feature in one of their games where if you shoot a sack of grain, the grain will flow out and the sack will deflate. And that's just like this insane attention to detail, right? Yeah, wow. Okay, and then it finishes up at Naughty Dog. Nobody asks the developers to crunch. Nobody has to ask. They'll be there anyway. That really changed my perception of this problem. For one thing, I like they are totally open about this in interviews. Apparently, they tell people when they hire them, look, this is how we do it here. And those people take the job. And according to this article, nobody forces you or even tells you to stay. They just do. Now, I always thought in like in EA's case, I always pictured this being management hovering over employees and saying, you know, if you can't stay late to do the job right, we might not have room for you, you know, implying work insane hours or we'll fire you. But right, here, right. But here it makes it obvious that people just do it of their own volition and that really until it uh, becomes old right until it gets like oh i don't want to live this way anymore and then they leave right and so to a certain extent i'd like to shove a tiny little share of the blame onto the staff like 70 percent of these people left okay it was obviously too much for them and i would like to know why didn't you just start going home at five like, make them fire you. Then you've got a case, <laughs> right? Yeah. Th then you've got a case for for the, that makes them the aggressor. To a certain extent, if you're letting them do it to you, the, I mean, uh, to be clear, uh, the moral thing for management to do is to put their foot down and say, no, you need to go home. You're going to burn out. Like, not just the moral thing, but the smart thing. Because you don't want your right. talented if people to talented, burn out. If you've got talented, well-trained people that know your systems and can operate efficiently in them, 
You don't want to drive them away by working them too hard, even if they want to work too hard. <laughs> right. And that's kind of your job as a boss is, you know, that's a time to step in if you see something destructive going on. But if you're just sort of like, again, a lot of these companies, the people at the top are money people and not creatives. And they're like, well, if people are just going to give us their labor for free, then okay. And it's not great, but at some point, can we, can we put a little bit of the blame onto the people that sort of enable this behavior? Go home. Just, you don't even have to like do something radical and form a union. Just, you know, go home at five. I realize it's probably not as easy as I'm saying it, but I, I'm kind of like thinking the way to break this stalemate is to push back against it. And this is very frustrating. It's like, okay, this is bad for the company and for the employees, but you have the power to like at least protect yourself, even if everybody else wants to work long hours. Just go home at five. And if they fire you, that makes them the villain instead of you being this self-martyr. Yeah. No, I, I mean, on the other hand, you can just, if you can find somewhere else to go, then maybe you just do that instead. Like, it seems like if they if they left and went somewhere else, they're not having trouble finding work elsewhere. So that's good. Right, right. I just I'd love to see what how would management react if people just started going home at five, and what would it slow the game down? Because everything I read about creative jobs suggests that you know each hour once you go over that eight or nine hours of useful work a day every additional hour is less productive than the one before. Because um, people need to take care of their needs. Like, they need to socialize, and they need to unwind, and they need to relax. You know, you... you and especially if you're doing creative work where you're, you're right. trying to draw on outside experiences, you're trying to express something true about the world, hopefully something profound, uh, you can't do that if you're you're just draining all day. Right. I mean, you absolutely can dig ditches until your body gives up, but you can't, like, make your brain be excited and creative. Like, if you're, the enthusiasm is gone, there's no way to continue to be passionate about a project, and that's what you need to do, really good creative work. Um so. On the other hand, there is the 30% who stayed, and maybe they can. Like, maybe they can be productive for 16 hours a day, six days a week. And, it's true. And it's enjoy true. it and, you know, be there and doing that. And, like, and for those people, maybe that's the right culture for them. I, I don't know. Right. I can imagine somebody doesn't have a lot of family, and they just, I mean, I do it all the time. I work insane hours at my job. But, you know, my job has a lot of variation into it, you know play a video game, write an article, read some news, record some audio, you know, there's a lot of day-to-day -day variation in my job. So it's not the same as coming in and just making a new 3D model every day. I, you know, and if I get tired of a topic, I can just start writing about something. Oh, I'm tired of doing narrative analysis in games. Let's do some programming for a while. Let's write about programming. Like, I have the freedom, to, and obviously they don't have that kind of freedom. So, I, but I, just to agree with you, I can work insane hours for a long time, and it's not a problem with me, for me. Although, I do um, save one day a week that I do no work on, and that's pretty important. And I think that's how I avoid burnout. I also have a day I don't do work on, but uh, I have a day job, so can't be creative all the time. Right, right. Well, I, I don't want to, like, put too much blame on the people, but I think, you know, the way the article was written, it sounds like nobody ever pushed back against this. Nobody ever said, nobody ever went to, in within the this article, nobody ever went to management and said, I can't keep up these hours anymore. What do you want to do? You want to fire me, or do you want me to work eight hours a day? Which would you prefer? And just, ha you know, it's always like everybody just keeps working insane hours, grows re resentful, and quits. And it feels like a little more communication would be good for the health of this company. 
Also, I do wonder about a company with so much of a gap between management and personnel. Like, doesn't like does they it? have a in work hours or? Well, that yeah, but like, do you not occupy the same building? Is there? I guess this is another thing that I wonder about in big AAA games. Is like, if this developer is in a totally different building than the management. You know, you have the creative leads in the building, but like the person f deciding how much the game gets funded and where it gets shipped. If that person is in another building, then how do they properly manage the people? You have to be aware of like the culture around your around your building. Like who's ultimately responsible for the people in this building and for setting the tone? That's really important. If people are loud and screwing around and distracting other people, or if there's a lot of squabbling and, you know, everybody's tense, or if management keeps changing plans, you want to be aware of that. This is the same thing we had with uh, Andromeda. And I wonder if this is like a structural problem. Like there's this huge gap between the publisher and the developer and nobody at the publisher is there to like have any idea what's going on inside the company like yeah, what the turning rank it like a file. black box where they're just like look right. don't tell us just give us a product in six months right and if i was in one of those management positions i would want to walk around the office once in a while and see how things were going are there any feuds are there you know do i see shouting in meetings is there a lot of stony silence and frosty glances and and people getting mad over petty things, which would suggest there's a lot of, you know, pent-up tension and anger and frustration? Do people look tired and haggard? And uh, it sounds like see, it sounds like the management wants to take care of people. They like make sure everybody has food. They keep the place. This is a nice office. It's a comfortable office. And they give everybody food. This isn't just they shove everybody into a concrete box and tell them to make a video game. It sounds like management cares, but they're too disconnected to be aware of what things are really like. Or maybe none of them are creative people and they just don't know that this is bad for the product. Right. Right. I worry. Yeah, that's another. So it, I, I wish we had more of this article. It's, it, although this comes from 13 different people. Here's one final question I have that suggests management is in another building. Jason Schreier, like six months ago or sometime last year, was invited to the Naughty Dog offices and was invited to walk around and shake hands with people. If I was, you know, the boss of that studio, and this notorious journalist that's been writing just scathing exposés on one, country, on one company after another was coming around to my office, I would like, who invited this guy? What's, what's going on? Why'd you invite this guy? <laughs> what, what's, yeah, what, what's wrong that he's coming here? now right is there something you should be talking to me about right before you go to the media <laughs> talk talk yeah. to me do we have a problem i need to know about before it winds up in the press so yeah it's like, like if it's like if zorro shows up to your villa you're like ah uh, i'm i have questions <laughs> right <laughs> where did where did i go wrong is there something somebody's not telling me so the fact that Nobody like had to sneak him in the 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 real managers the real money people and the real hiring and firing power must not reside in that building That's all I can think of it, Yeah, it seems like or or they think that they're doing everything right and they're like this is fine like nothing's wrong Jason Schreer is probably gonna write an article about how awesome we are <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean he can't he can't write scathing articles about every place he goes. He doesn't go to the grocery store and the clerks are all like, oh no, he's going to talk about our work hours. Like, he right. probably just visits, the, you know, and says hi to people. He probably visits a lot more studios than he writes articles about, I'd right. imagine. But he also goes around and evidently, you know, exchanges business cards with a lot of people and they reach out to him and then he writes an article. Yeah, yeah. Whew. All right, I swear there's going to be a non-depressing discussion somewhere in today's show all right let's keep trying um okay here's here's an interesting one 
Academia School Simulator. Have you ever heard of it? No, I have not. Me neither. Is this, is this related to My Hero Academia? I don't think so. This is more of a tycoon type or sim type game. Okay. So, this article is from the end of February. So this is fairly recent and it's on, it's on Gamma Sutra. Which I feel strongly we should be pronouncing it Gamma Sutra since, you know, the beginning of that is from video game. But everybody calls it Gamma Sutra, which makes it sound like it has to do with gamma radiation. I suppose I the... I think it's supposed to be a pun on the Kama Sutra, right? I know, I know, but like Gamma Sutra, the, the pun doesn't work. That's the point here. The yeah, pun does not yeah, work. It, it doesn't work either way. Yeah. All right. So this game, you, you know, we're always like, how, how are its funding for games doing and how much money is people making? What's it cost to make a video game and whatever? So here's something I love is every once in a while in Gamma Sutra, uh, somebody shares just their numbers. They just, you know, obviously indies, the big publishers are, you know, kind of two-faced. You know, when they talk to us in the public, they're like, we have to do these incredible irritating things to remain solvent. And then they go to their shareholders and they're like, we are making all the money, don't worry, buy our stock, everything is fantastic all the time. Yeah, we, we could be standing on our heads all day and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> right? Uh, we are guaranteed to make billions and billions every time somebody sneezes, so don't worry. And then they come to us and say, oh, I know microtransact, but we have to do that. You know, it's people want this and we just have to, games are expensive to make. And it, DRM is, is, is a sad necessity. Right. But here's an indie that has shared their numbers with us. So this game basically is a success because of Jacksepticeye, who is a YouTuber of some sort. I've, mm -hmm. seen I've watched him, a few of his videos. I've seen him like suggested on YouTube, but I don't think I've ever clicked on any of his thing. For one thing, the the his name is super disturbing as somebody who has terrible eye problems. Um, <laughs> right. Doesn't have good feel. Yeah, it just makes me nervous every time. I don't want to get septic eye watching his videos. So anyway, he he did, you know, I guess a live stream or videos on this or whatever it is he does. And that gave this game a huge boost in sales. Um so this looks like like Prison Architect. Like I can't see any difference between this game and Prison Architect. Well, one's a school and one's a prison. So yeah, basically the same thing. Uh, it, what's interesting is they is they've brought in a million dollars now oh, from good. sales. And you say, okay, that sounds really good. And people hear something like a million dollars, and they think, oh, these people are rolling in cash. Look at them being greedy. I hear this all the time. Anytime you hear a super big number, and everybody's like, oh, they're just, you know, they've sold out, and they're just enjoying their sports cars now, and they don't care about us anymore. And I don't know, maybe. But these guys have shared the the breakdown of where the money goes. Between U.S. taxes, that they're from... Uh, the Philippines, which evidently means they pay U.S. taxes. Mm -hmm. um, the the developer is called Squeaky Wheel. Between the U.S. taxes and VAT and other countries' taxes and the steam cut, all of that combined takes about half the money. So, boom! Now yeah, you're down to five hundred. Right. Yeah, that all of that together is about five hundred grand left and taken. Okay, and then another bite of it is taken by in investors, you know, people that invested to make this game happen. Sure, and they didn't just save up for years and spend their savings. They went to investors right. and said, hey, here's the idea, here's the pitch, here's what we're going to sell it for, here's our targeted audience, here's how much money they have, here's how much we're expecting to make back, here's the timeline and all that stuff. So once that's over, now they have about 16 grand over, you know, since the launch of the game, you know, of course, profits go up and down, but that leaves them on average with 16 grand a month. And then eight grand of that goes into the company. I mean, they, they, uh, they got to pay their expenses and pay for the building and, and of course, save up money. So, wait, 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 let me, let me make sure I'm reading this correctly. All right. 7,500 goes to the staff 
and some miscellaneous office expenses. And you said, say, 7500 sounds pretty good, but then that's six people. And <laughs> split six ways, yeah. Oof. That's that's barely over a thousand a piece. And in the US that would have you well below the poverty, like way below. In the Philippines, I guess that's not terrible money. Um that would be completely they get to go out to eat every once in a while. Right. But they also pay, you know, office expenses out of some of that. So they don't even get all that seven thousand dollars. But apparently oh, that, man. That, yeah, and then the rest is going into the company coffers, hopefully, so that, the, you know, the next time they make a game, they don't need investors. They can just make the game. You know, they're basically saving for future development, which is wise. Right. That's, right. that's really wise. Uh, so you're not always running on fumes and always, like, two months from insolvency. So you hear a million dollars, and then once all the money's cut out and everybody gets their cut, you realize, wow... That's not much left. <laughs> um, suddenly, that's go switching to the Epic Steam or the Epic Steam, the Epic Game Store looks really attractive. Like what the biggest bite out of this whole mess is the Steam cut, and if you could right reduce it's right that, off the top, right, and if you sell your game on the Epic Store, which these guys are not doing, they're they're on Steam, but if you did go to, for Epic. Your biggest expense would be way smaller. So that would immediately have huge benefits for everybody. So yeah, yeah, Epic Store looks really, really attractive when you look at these numbers. But they're on Steam and they're apparently, according to them, this is okay. They're doing okay. Not going out of business this month. Right. Which I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad, you know... The introversion software, the guys who made Prison Architect, were also kind of in that same boat where they'd make a hit, but then it had to last them for like four years until they got the next game out, and it's like two or three people, or maybe four people, and uh, it's right. like, well, that's a lot of money, but then you gotta make it count because you know you don't you don't get any more until you finish another game, right? And this is why so many. Developers begin sell, selling themselves to big publishers in the middle of the last decade, um, in the middle of the er, in, in the early aughts, when just ever all the indies were vanishing and becoming publisher owned. Uh, this is why, yeah. You, if you if you have a game that kind of doesn't do well enough, then you won't have enough money to fund all the way through to another finish another game. And then you're done. And probably that's what happened to a lot of them. You have one week game, especially, you know, the big, you know, the Xboxes came out or whatever. Uh, there was that jump up in graphics quality right around 2004 when suddenly you were expected to have bump mapping when you weren't before. And that makes games a lot more expensive. Well, I shouldn't say a lot more. At the time, probably quite a bit more expensive. Certainly more work. And, you know, all it takes is one underperforming game, and all of a sudden you don't have enough money to do the next one. And then EA yeah. gobbled well, everything it's, up. It's not just the, the hours for making the assets. It's the hours for making the assets, and then the hours for making the engine, and then the hours for setting up the level so the lighting looks right with the bump mapping. And right. it's like, it makes everything harder, so... Yeah, yeah, right. It adds onto everybody's work, not just like one person's. The person that makes the models now needs to be aware that it's going to be bump mapped, which affects how you build right. the model. Yeah, yeah. So that was a very educational thing, and I just, I'm so grateful to this team for sharing their numbers. I, I think that's really good. I think it's really healthy, healthy and helpful to other Indies who are trying to make plans and you know, they're sitting there with a small nest egg like well I saved up a hundred thousand bucks and I got like 50,000 in investments Do we have enough to make a game? I don't know You know this type of information will help more people to complete a good game or decide not to Waste a fortune on a game. They won't be able to finish. We'll get you know 
it, it'll be better all around. Yeah. And also, hopefully, will help investors make better decisions on what's a reasonable expectation for a small team. Right. Because if you don't know how much money it costs, if there's no transparency, then it's hard from the other side, too, of like, hey, you know, I don't know how, how far this money is going to go. Right. Seems like seems like moving your team to the Philippines is a good move. <laughs> My goodness, <laughs> live live on a thousand bucks a month. I wonder how old the cast like is this like a 40 year old guy working for a thousand bucks a month, takes the money home, feeds his family, keeps a roof on the house? Or is this some hungry 23 year old that lives with his parents that's making a thousand bucks a month? Like, I have no frame of reference for the Philippines, so I have no idea how bad or good that money might be over there. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? They've got, uh, they've got, apparently they've got really big shopping malls over in the Philippines. I've heard it's a very uh, welcoming place for Westerners, especially Americans, to visit. It's a, evidently a really great place. I've heard nothing but good things about it. But I know very little about the country because I don't travel. Um, if anybody listening is from the Philippines, I would love to hear about how how reasonable this is. And are these developers well off or not? I would be very happy if they were well off on their thousand bucks a month. All right, let's do some mailbags. Dear Diecast, do you think that video games in the West should adopt the director role that they have in Japan? Where they try to keep a consistent vision and them for the game. Hmm. When Western games have someone who seems to be the one making the decisions or has a mostly clear vision of what the game should be like, like Ken Levine with the Bioshock games, they seem to be a more consistent whole. But they seem to be the rarity, at least publicly. Okay. Um, there's more. You can read the rest of this. This is from Horatio J. Hoodoo, which, okay... That's an awesome name. That is fun. Horatio J. Hoodoo. That's cool. Um, has there been any past games that you can think of had a director-like role in development for good or bad? Uh, I have answers for both of these. Peter Molyneux for bad. Um, he hit... Oh, I'm still angry at him over the Fable games. Um, oh, he has, yeah. He has such I'm still angry odd... at him over Goddess. Right? He has such odd insid like he wants to do things because he thinks they'd be neat, not because they would make for a good game. He has a lot of things like that. On the good side, I would say I really appreciated Warren Spector. That's uh Deus Ex and oh what was the other one? Was he was he in on System Shock 2? De Deus Ex? Maybe oh, I've forgotten. He did a few of those immersive sim type games back in the day. And uh, I really liked his design sensibilities. I mean, his games always resonated with me like, oh, yeah, this is just what I'm looking for. I cheated and looked up his Wikipedia page. He worked on a lot of games. But yes, Deus Ex Invisible War, uh, Thief Deadly Shadows. Yeah, Thief Deadly Shadows, which is is very much the runt of the original Thief games. Um, just because the engine limitations they were under wasn't a bad game otherwise, but oh, Ultima Underworld. Crippled. Yeah, Ulti that's the one I was thinking of. I knew there was some, uh, you know, kind of open exploration kind of thing. He likes to make a lot of interlocking systems, like sort of like make a bunch of game systems and then simply allow them to interact. Apparently, uh, he also produced System Shock. He was the producer on System Shock. Interesting. And he worked on Thief the Dark Project. There you go. Yeah. So that's that's his thing. And I really loved all of his work, except I've never played the Ultima games. Any of them. You know, I never have either. I've heard about them, and it, like people seem to really like them when they get into them, but I don't know. I, I've never... I've never had the impetus to to dive into any of that stuff. Right. Those games came right when I was just not in a place to play video games. I uh, you know, all the all the um nineties kind of RPGs, I just 
didn't even occur to me to try those out. <laughs> um, and I didn't play a lot of games back then, except I definitely played do I played a few shooters, and that was like my mainstay. I was a shooter guy in my 20s. But it never occurred to me to like, why don't you try these role-playing games? And I'm not even sure why that is, because I had a few pirated ones from high school, and I loved those. But I never <laughs> bought one for myself. Like, back in my, back in my wayward youth when I pirated games. I, I liked every RPG I played, but then it never occurred to me to like, I should go buy some of these for myself. I don't know. Young people are dumb, I guess. Or at least I was. Well, I think we finally reached the good news part of the, the episode because uh, Peter Molyneux still works at 22 Cans and he's not making anything these days. And Warren There's Spector is on the team for, he's on the team for System Shock 3. That is, both of those things are good news. I would feel better if Peter Molyneux was employed picking up cans. I think that's more <laughs> suited to his abilities. <laughs> Like, you know, I see garbage on the ground in a lot of places. And if that garbage wasn't there, my life would be better. And I think he could probably do that job without fucking it up. So, you know, if somebody <laughs> if, wants to get if, him on that. If Peter Molyneux walked by your house every day and was just like picking cans up off the street, you got to be like, hey, Peter, that'd make your day. Right. Yeah. I would eventually, after a few years of that, kind of forgive him for Fable 2. I'm just uh. kidding. I'm never going to forgive him. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Diecast, when, what do you do when you aren't sure whether or not a game will be playable on your computer? Give up? Buy it anyway? Ask the internet for help? I always end up comparing the... Mid okay, we see where this question's going. I'm, I'm hoping you know a better way. John, thank you for a very good question, John. I'm afraid my answer will be of limited use because... If I buy a game and it doesn't work out, I get to write an article about it. Uh, so th for me, there's always that safety net. But back in the day before I reviewed games for a living, I was always the Hope Springs Eternal person. I was I had a horrible computer for like a lot of the 90s. I couldn't upgrade very often because it was you know work pro computer made for um, programming on and not a gaming machine. And it often wasn't mine, so I didn't want to put money into it. Or if it was mine, I couldn't afford to put money into it. <laughs> right. And so I would always just roll the dice. And I wound up with a lot of games that just... Re I played, in for a lot of the 90s, I played quite a few games at 10 and 15 frames a second, which I, you know, I don't put up with today. But back then, Oof. I was just... In yeah. fact... System Shock 1, as much as I love that game, I think I played most of that game at like 8 frames a second. Ugh. Yeah, it was brutal. It was brutal. Like, I almost don't recognize the game with the smooth frame rate. I'm like, oh, this is so weird. I can move. Uh, like, at 8, the, you know, this is in the early days of physics when they hadn't quite worked out how physics were going to work yet. So, you handled worse at eight frames a second like you couldn't like you turn and you just sort of keep going like you're a car with tons of momentum <laughs> so i just like bump around like a pinball around the station so that means you know to keep in control you have to like creep along very slowly which you know it was a quasi stealth game so that worked out but uh yeah my, my tolerance back in the day was a lot better. Paul, is this a problem you've ever had to deal with? It never has been, really. Uh, most of the games that I grew up playing were more turn-based strategy kind of stuff. Uh, Warcraft and Civilization and things like that. Uh, SimCity. And so it never was a problem of like, oh, well, I can't turn the graphics up or I can't get the, the response time I need to do this game well. It was always just kind of like, well, you know, like... When you speed it up to cheetah mode, it doesn't go quite as fast. And we were always kind of hovering around waiting for dad to get off work so we could use his work computer because his work computer was so fast. And so we'd load our cities in and then like speed it up to cheetah mode so we could make a bunch of money. And then we put it back on our computer right. and like, you know, build some more city. So he had it, one but of those it was never a problem fast. for gameplay. It was just like, does it work? He, he had one of those super fast 486s. Yes, yes, he had a 486 in his home office. 
and uh you know the luxury the sheer luxury yes i remember i remember the glory of when i got to play uh doom on a 486 i felt like i was king of the world so so it's never really been a problem for me and so it's always been like is this a game i want to play as opposed to is this a game that my computer will play yeah and this was this was back in the days where you couldn't return games and i'd buy a game and wouldn't really be able to run it and i just sort of like what game was it that i oh magic carpet peter molyneux game speaking <gasps> of i played yeah. that game our neighbors had yeah. a copy yeah it's a weird like like all of peter molyneux's games is weird and idiosyncratic and I kind of liked it. I kind of liked it enough to play it when it was really the only game I owned that I hadn't played a thousand times. Right? <laughs> like, that's, right. that's what it was like back in the day. You buy one game every six months or one game a year. Because, one, because yeah. my computer's yeah. terrible, and two, because I don't have time. But I, at some point, I had Magic Carpet, and I could barely get it into playable frame rate if I turned the options down and then you know how old games used to let you make the display smaller right so it would just like sure. render to less of the screen and so I was playing in this tiny little you know probably 160 by I don't know what what would be the resolution 160 yeah. by 100 160 postage by, yeah yeah 100 or by 80 or whatever Right, and it was just this postage stamp window, and it was ridiculous, and it was so choppy. And I always assumed this game would be pretty great if if it ran smoothly, but I, I don't... With what I've learned in the 20 years since then, I don't think that's the case. No, it always was a little weird. Our neighbors had a, a really fast computer that had like a Pentium or something, and uh, we went over and played it a few times, and it was always kind of janky, like you'd... You're flying right. around on this carpet and you've got like mana spheres that are just popping up all over the place and picking up things and, and then there's all these spells and you don't know how to use them and the manual's just no use and it, yeah, it was a weird, it was a weird experience. Yeah, I liked the game. Well, I played up until like at some point in the game, it takes away all of the power. You've been getting a new spell every level. And at some point it takes them all away and then the following levels were like okay do it with only these two powers okay now do it with only these two and it felt like a huge step down like that takes away yes that makes the game harder but it also takes away a ton of depth so the so game it was, was just the the toss you in prison and torture scene again right <laughs> It was just like no depth and it was just frustrating and boring and levels took forever and I'm like The little magic that this this game was offering me is now gone. I never got past that point I played that level and the next one and realized this is not worth it and I bailed I never came back to it. I don't think we even got that far, but I'm glad we didn't waste our time So yeah, uh, and then nowadays like, you don't even really have to worry about it. Like, unless you've really got just a potato of a computer, everything runs and everyone's got graphic settings so you can just turn it down until it runs well. Uh, I don't think it's... Uh, unless I'm missing something, I don't think it's really an issue anymore. Uh, it was an issue for Wolfenstein The New Colossus. I had hardware that was near the lower system specs and it was mostly playable. But there were a few levels that were just like... Okay, most of the time the game gets like near 30 frames a second, but then a couple of levels for no perceptible reason would just be single digit frame rates. Ugh. And at the time I assumed, well, you know, the game looks like ass, but that's probably because I have this older graphics card. But now I upgraded and I played the game on, you know, my current computer, which is absolute beast. And the game still looks like ass. Compared to other things with those performance <laughs> requirements. Like, the game is just super boring looking. And it's like, hey, you know, what should we do to make this blank concrete wall more interesting? Well, we could make that almost featureless concrete surface a, you know, 4K texture. <laughs> I think it like, I think that was the whole design. Like, everything was so repetitive and just boring hallways with 
tons of texture detail that, like, who cares? It's tons of texture detail that doesn't, like, show you anything interesting. It's just, oh, look, more 4K metal grating on the floor. <laughs> it's like the most pointless, pointless waste of computing powder, power I'd ever seen. It was a terrible game. Terrible game. Okay, well, so other than terrible games, you don't have to worry about it. True. True, and that was an outlier. There was definitely something wrong with that engine, that its system specs were that out of line. It's true that even before I got this computer upgrade, I was using a six-year-old computer, and I was still doing fine, aside from Wolfenstein. You know, things would once in a while get a little choppy, but totally a six-year-old computer still running the latest games, and they looked pretty good. Like, we are living yeah, in a magical time now. Yeah, it would be unthinkable back in the 90s. Yeah, that was ridiculous. No, it was like two years old was like the limit. After two years, your computer was going to have single digit frame rates and it was going to be terrible. And four if is it just even ran frenetic. at all, right? Like right. The, all the, the operating system stuff and all the underlying commands. I, I don't know what they were RAM. doing with chip architectures, but yeah, and, and RAM sizes and RAM rates. Yeah, the game like, oh, it's been three years. Now this game will not even fit into ram <laughs> that's how <laughs> right. far we've come oh yeah we've come along I, i'm i'm loving this world where potato computers can still game i think this is this is a total win well i guess i'll end by saying good luck to everyone using potato computers i feel your pain i've been there and good luck at least these days we ha you can return games on steam yeah yeah it's very nice and and you can make wish lists on Epic now, so everything's great. Wish list, really? That's what they implemented is a wish list. <laughs> they really need <laughs> a shopping cart. They give away two free games like a week or a month, and you have to buy each of them for zero dollars one at a time. You can't shove both of them in your cart. <laughs> you have to step through the <laughs> such a stupid, stupid system. Come on, fix that. Like there have been games where I've like. All right, that's the one free game this week. Now there's another. But do I want to sit here and slowly click through their slow-ass web-based thing and through the f those five pages again? Nah. Like, the game wasn't even worth the time it would take to click through. Right. Do I want to burden myself with the inconvenience of a, a few moments of effort? No, I don't think right. I do. I don't think I do. I'm just going to go back over to Steam. Ah, oh, it's so sad because like you see those games and like someone worked hard on those games and now they're right. basically in the bargain bin for zero dollars and like and you, you just imagine them sitting there like obviously people are playing them but like you just imagine them sitting there lonely and being like oh no one even will take my game for for zero dollars oh I, so I think of them as the video game equivalent of like the toy you get in a box of cereal like that's where your that's where your game is now. Yeah. Oh, ouch. It, to be fair, uh, especially early in the process, some of them were pretty good. Some of the games were good. A lot of them were stuff I already I already owned. But I was like, hey, I'll just own it on another platform. You never know when that might be useful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like The Witness, perfectly serviceable. Very good. Right. Game. And I just I just fired up. Um, because we're talking about this, I realized, oh, time to log into Epic and get my free games. And, oh, oh, they're killing me. Now there's three free games right now. This is going to take what? all night. <laughs> have to click through and keep clicking through. But there's also an update to Satisfactory, which I didn't even... There is. Yeah, well, it's, it's oh, just wait, the um, update three got pushed to early access instead of experimental. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd look. Introducing the world of fluids. Okay, I've been in that world. It was cool, but I'm done for now. Call me when you can reverse the y-axis on the computer. Whatever vehicles. <laughs> in the car, yeah. All right. Paul, I feel like we've done a show. Here it is. Another one. Another pristine podcast delivered to you, the audience. Thank you so much to everybody who sent in questions. If you have a question for Paul and I, you can send it to diecast at shamusyoung.com. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye.